Hello, Miss Michelle Gray and my lovely boy, Eric, who I love. Hello, Elisa. And Eric says, hi, mom. He's giving you a really big hug today, not just kisses. He's arms yeah. right around you, giving you a big mm. hug. Thank you, baby. Now, of course, Eric uh, picked this topic for today uh, yes. to pull us out of our comfort zone, both of us, uh, Michelle and I, and uh, it's sex. We're going to talk about sex. Of course, as a physician, yes. it's like not as, but still, you know, everybody has some weird things about sex, so it should be interesting. So these are actually all from blog members. I may come up with a question. Michelle, you might come up with a question. Eric, you might spout out an answer to a question nobody's asked. So yeah. it's free for all. All right. He says right on, I got to tell you, he is showing himself today in, um, <sighs> He's got like uh, a, it looks like a deep disc pants, like these rip away. Uh oh, your audio went off. Am I back? Oh, yeah, I'm back. You're back. You're back. Good. Okay. Okay. Oh, by the way, I don't Sorry. have headphones because mine broke yesterday. So I'm oh, I, okay. But. Um, he's he's got a whistle around his neck and he's got a pointer and he's like. Sex ed with oh, Eric. God. I he remember. is very like he's raring to go. He's ready to talk. And what's that? No, go ahead. Oh, he's um. He started singing this song. He's doing that. I think it was by Salt and Salt and Pepper. I'm probably saying it wrong. But um, he's like, let's talk about sex, baby. And he's doing the whole oh, thing. No. <laughs> oh, my God. All he's right. highly entertaining. Yeah. It should be. Uh, I remember when you were little, Eric, we would always talk about, okay, special ed. And then we mentioned drivers, ed, you know, over months and months. And then eventually he said, well, who is this ed guy anyway? <laughs> you were like five or six years old. It was hilarious. All right, so <laughs> first question. Why? Okay. Are some people that don't shoot the messengers, not this is not my questions, uh, especially men, into nasty sex? First of all, what is next nasty sex? Well, Eric says, so remember that absolutely everything has different shades to it. So he says everything has polarity to it. So we can look at sex in so many different ways. Um, he said that if we look at the act of sex, we can look at this as, um, well, he says, okay, let's, let's look at the, um, okay, separate it for me though, Eric. Okay. He's saying that there's different levels to it. So we have to remember that we can go shopping and we can look at our budget and keep ourselves on budget and say spend a hundred dollars and be satisfied with that or maybe we have a shopping addiction and we just go gung-ho and we spend all of our money and we get into trouble he says sex is no different he goes remember it's just a word that we use to describe something that has many different components to it so why does somebody desire say something that we'll consider nasty and he says and he also wants to address that too he's like what is nasty yeah what is how, how do we how do we say that because he says this also goes into judgment this goes into okay. um many different little layers of topics that we could get into but he says i'll generalize it and i will explain it in the way that you can have a beer or you can have 12 beers and it's up to you where that judgment line is so you can be into sex he says the missionary position or you can be a little kinkier and he says where's the judgment but there are people that also have um he says he doesn't want to label this as bad, but there are impulses mm -hmm. that are present. There are many different reasons why a person would have an impulse. He says that um, men, there is a really big, um, and he's actually calling it, it's a little bit of a myth because 
there's this idea that all men or many men have a dirty mind and that they're always thinking of sex and that's all it is. And yes, there is a degree of that, but he says it's actually um, less the other. Um, okay. Yes. He's saying there's a lot of um, men or uh, relationships that are lacking sex. And he's saying that there's like a, um, he's kind of dancing all over with this topic a little bit, but he's saying that there are different degrees of um, us judging somebody. Okay, no, back up there a little bit, Eric. Sorry. He's getting me a little bit distracted because uh -huh. I think he's, yeah. As long as he doesn't flash himself. Hey, Eric, no, leave he's not. EVP. Leave it. EVP. He's not doing that. <laughs> But what he's, but what he is saying is he's, what he's trying to explain to me and, um, okay. He says, just go ahead, Michelle. What he's trying to explain to me is that many people, um, think that men are driven by sex and only sex. And while that is true to a degree, there's also a lot of men or people in general that say man might not have a sex drive or as strong of a sex drive for one reason or another. And that causes a lot of embarrassment. And there's this social idea that men are a certain way. And so he says, that's a, another something too. But when we talk about dirty sex, he says, when it's not hurting anyone, yes. when you're not hurting yourself or anyone else, that's where we can put a line there. That's where we can say, and then we could move into, you know, is there something going on with that person mentally? Is there something that happened in their life? Uh, he's also saying that a lot of times um, sexual deviance or sexual attraction to something specific has a connection. And he says it can be a connection to something within a person's life. And it can also be something from a past life as well. Ah. So what about, uh, let's talk about some of these deviancies, I guess. What about uh, sexual addiction? Tell me about that. Where does that come from? Eric. Okay. He says, well, he says addiction, like anything, he says it's pleasure. So sex, the act of sex is also pleasure. And so he says, I'm going to throw something at you just to explain this. First of all, he goes, what if I were to tell you that procreation was not the main purpose of sex? Okay. If I were to say that that's not really it, that we are feeling beings and that feeling is connection to the highest vibration, which is love. So it's that act, that unity. So a person, uh, much like taking a drug, um, there are chemicals released in the brain, sex, the act of sex, that desire, um, libido, he says, is actually life force. It means life force. And so that is something that if someone, just like whether it be alcohol or drugs or anything else, they're disconnected from their higher self. They're disconnected from themselves in some way where they feel that they need to repeat this act or repeat this desire to get the same result over and over again. So he says it has a lot of the same types of um, inner workings that we would also see in any other type of addiction. Is it like dopamine based, serotonin based? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. All of the yes. above. Okay. So yes. why I, I hear, I've heard that men want to uh, have sex because it's a way for them to show affection um is that true and 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 also why do why is the main motivator for women to have sex so eric says this is where we fall into those little bit of patterns where um there is a belief that that's the way it is he says there are a lot of couples behind closed doors that are not experiencing things quite this way um he goes did you, were you going to ask something else before? I no, did? no, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So he just said that, um, let's look at it as, um, okay. When we look at the emotional balance, 
Um, he says se the sexual vibration, the love vibration, uh, unity, uh, he says it has a uh, masculine and feminine to it. So every pair, every sexual act, each person that is matched vibrationally will have, one will have more of a feminine, one will have more of a masculine. He says it's like yin and yang with everything. There's that bipolarity in both. Now he says that women um, can be wired differently and this has to do with mothering and emotions where women had been more connected emotionally. But he says that's also, again, something that society had played into in um, raising men into believing that they were not connected. Oh. And so when we think about generations and generations of the men go out and do the work, they hunt, they forge, they're physical, they're this, and the women are caring and childbearing and loving. And he says, so when we look at it that way, the woman um, has a role, an expectation where they feel they need to play. And so does the man. So a man will feel that he needs to care for his wife physically that sex is how he shows that affection, especially for a man that may not be connected deeply to their own emotions, because each person has a masculine and a feminine um, polarity within them as well. So if this man or uh, the masculine in the relationship is not connected to themselves, they're gonna have more difficulty uh, communicating with emotion. And so that's where we get these gaps. And he says, and there's also um, this particular conversation, um, and he keeps going back to people feeling um, like they don't want to talk about it because it's embarrassing, or it makes them look like they're in a marriage that isn't working right, or a relationship that's not working right. And that is when sex becomes dysfunctional, uh, when it becomes obsolete when it becomes something that the man is expected to have sex. The man is expected to be able to do his duty, Eric says. And when that's not happening, the partner then feels like something is wrong. And what if there is something medical that's changing with this person? What if there are numerous different things, stress, he goes all these different things that in society, that we have with our everyday lives now that aren't the same as when some of these judgments came into place years and years and generations ago. So he's just saying that there's a lot to be said about what we believe sex is and what the expectations of what we should and shouldn't be doing is. And he mm. says, there's a lot of judgment in there. And he says, the very best thing to remember is that sex is an act. It's a physical act, and as human beings, as human beings being connected to our physicality, we look at it as the act of becoming close in the genitalia and having that connection, where is, in actuality, it is the highest vibration of connection, and when we go into spirit, the physicality of it isn't there any longer but the vibration of the closeness and the oneness is what it truly is about. So okay. he's, he's trying to draw a circle to the oh. whole thing. <laughs> yeah. That's good. So the, uh, the components of a healthy self life, I think would be being very connected to yourself, your, your body, your emotions. I don't know your authentic self. I mean, what are the components, uh, of a healthy self self life except for the medical stuff the physical stuff that can go on so eric says it's it's how you feel it always boils down to how you feel and how you feel emotionally so to keep yourself connected um to keep yourself with the flow of yourself so he's saying that your higher self and your lower self were wanting to connect those emotions connect oh, yeah. and ground ourselves and he says when you do that all areas of your life fall together okay. so whatever is say uh yeah he doesn't want me to use the word lacking i went to say lacking he's yeah. like whatever is in resistance in your life yeah. he says 
rather than fly to the resistance and focus on that and look to fix, 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 he says, ease yourself up and take care of how you feel. Take care of how, what's going on here, what you're thinking, and is this all connecting? Is heart and head connecting? Because yeah. once you're able to do that for yourself, and he says, do that for yourself, not do that for other people. You're thinking for yourself and you're feeling for yourself. Everything else begins to connect and it takes time for that momentum to work together, but you're, you're um, feeling good. And this is whether you're in a relationship with someone or not, your sexuality is so much more than just the, the genitalia. He says, what about when we talk about food porn? What about that? Yeah. He says, when we look at food and the richness and the joy and the pleasure and the appreciation, he says, we can take all of those feelings and put them into absolutely anything. So he says, I can still address you who's listening that maybe isn't having sex right now. Oh, hang on. I forgot to turn on my lights. Bad me. But go ahead. Keep talking. So um, let's see. Oh, how I forgot that. I've never forgotten that, forgotten that before. Okay. So um. So I think self-love is super important also, right? For a healthy sex life. Yes. Yes. And he and he says appreciation mental. of yourself. Yes. The four roommates have to be all in alignment. The physical, the, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. Yes. Probably. For the yes. better. You know. All right, let's yes. talk about some more of the deviant stuff. Uh, what about incest? Why? Why do some people have ancestral relationships? Well, he says this is, this is something that has a couple different categories to it as well, because we could also tie this back to um, generations. He says if we go back into generations where incest may have happened as something that wouldn't have been looked at as socially wrong. Yeah, I bet there are cultures that. where, you know, I mean, in the animal kingdom, that happens too, so. Yes, and, and there are cultures that are okay, and there are situations where people do marry in second cousins and third cousins that we hear about all the time. Yeah. But he said, you know, there are a couple things at play here. Um, when we go to abuse, when we look at incest and abuse, that together, he says that comes from uh, the desire. Um, it could be a trigger from something. Uh, what he's showing me is he's giving me an example of somebody. Um, he's showing me a father figure and a daughter, a young daughter. and something happening in the situation he's also saying like a grandparent an uncle these are situations that happen yeah. and he says that particular individual has either had a form of abuse happen to them in their lifetime he says there's a lot of subconscious work that's happening as well that is able to convince and allow this person to believe that this act is okay, even though a part of them may tell them that, no, this is wrong, or no, I shouldn't be doing this. But he said, so there is also, um, he's talking about wiring. So this could go to mental illness as well. Yeah. So we could also go to a portion that there's that that happens um, too. But he said, in our society and in this day and age, um, there are many reasons why we look at incest as not um, a productive thing to do, and for many medical reasons. Oh, yeah, and, genetic reasons, yeah. Right, so he says, um, but as far as it goes as something that is okay for the individual, um, both individuals, right? Like a brother and sister, a consensual type relationship. Right. He says, okay. you know, he says, if that, if that is happening, um, he goes and, and it can't really be a one size fits all because he's saying that there have been instances where that's a life plan, where that's something that is meant to live itself out, that it has um, learning and purpose to it, where it doesn't mean that it was accepted. 
it doesn't mean that it was um, looked upon as um, something good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there was something mentally wrong with either of them either. Right. So, um, so maybe, maybe they were, maybe in some cases, uh, they were lovers in another life, but then now are related. Yeah, you just channeled that. That's oh, what Eric wow. just said. Cool. Yes, yes, yeah. All right. Um, so what, is, what, what would be the spiritual purpose of coming in with the uh, contract to uh, engage in mutually consensual incest? So he says, um, first of all, to be able to um, love through adversity, ah. to connect through adversity. He says that would be one of the most difficult, uh, challenging types of relationships. Um, he's talking about that one being more difficult than a lot of the contracts that involved race at a time where that wasn't accepted. Yeah. And so he says that this would have been at a time um he says when because there was a time a long a long time ago he says where that wouldn't have been such a horrible thing yeah but so this would have been more about the adversity the people around them the judgment um the pain um he's also showing that there is a um, not a happy ending to all of them yeah. It doesn't always end up, um, he says, there has been, um, oh, that's in, a lot of suicide with it, oh. because there's, um, uh, like, ending their own life, he says, it, uh, a lot of conflict, a lot of conflict within themselves as sure. well. Sure. Society makes them probably judge themselves. So what about non-consensual incest? What would be the number one in the interest of time, spiritual con uh, purpose for that. The first thing he just said was desire. Desire? And that's interesting. Okay. Desire. He said that to be able to. to exercise control of desire. So not being to exercise, do you mean not being able to exercise the control? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> On both sides? No, he's saying that this would be in a situation, um, he's showing me like an older sibling and a younger sibling. Yeah, right. Um, and, he, and he says not generalizing on whether it's like male, female, he's saying, right female female male male it doesn't it doesn't matter it's right. all the same um uh he's also saying um shame and self-judgment is another one to overcome um sometimes in families when something does happen and other family members become aware of it it becomes the big family secret yeah. it becomes something very shameful and um becomes a buried, uh, he's calling about, uh, uh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, he says that this is something that has karmic release that is playing out in families right now. Oh, that there yeah. are, um, there is generational karma that this had happened in, in many families. And it may have been uh, a grandparent. It may have been a close uncle, oh, uh, like an older. DNA almost, right? right? Like, like spiritual but, DNA kind of? Yes, yes, yes. So, and so that would carry forward to play out in um, in this lifetime to be exposed, to be understood, to be um, accepted as something that did happen and to be able to relieve blame because he says that there is still um, projection. So a generation that is still alive, there'd be projection yeah. of some of that. Yeah. All right. So, um, how do you handle? Can you go like take one of the uh, people involved uh, into between lives and figure out if that was a plan or would past life regression help? Because like, oh my God, we were lovers in 1844. I mean, uh, how do you approach that to give relief to both parties? 
while he says it, this is again can be a multi a multi symptom type treatment so depending on whether both parties are on the same page um he says if an individual was looking for some sort of relief to understanding that or to releasing that from their life he's talking about hypnosis um oh. He also okay. is talking about um, past life regression, and um, he says if you've been the one that was inflicted, so oh. if you are the one that is directly inflicted from um, sexual abuse of some sort that has been through your family, he said that you directly want to address your abuse or um, Okay, he's talking about tapping, like um, okay, being able to tap on the um, going back to the feeling using regression. He's talking about using more than one thing. So whether okay. that's in combination with tapping, he also says that um, depending on the severity of the situation, whether therapy um, needs to be involved as well, because he said that this all depends on how this is settled in somebody's dna or how this is right. within their um if it's their life in their life plan and it is something that needs to be cleared and released to move forward from because he's just showing me how there are different offshoots of energetic um like life purposes lessons um opportunities that can come from this to be able to help others and he says that's what a lot of this, the karmic releasing that's happening right now has a lot of um, speaking up and sharing yeah. is what's coming from it. So it's helping a lot of people like exactly what we're doing today. He says all of this is all part of this healing. Um, but he said to be able to, what's most important is to be able to identify um, how you feel. If, the, if you feel that you're listening to this right now and he says, you know if you're going right back to something that happened in your life or you feel you feel like this resonates like there's something there that you know says go and check it out and whether that means checking it out yourself and taking time and meditating going down that rabbit hole and connecting those dots then do that if it feels like you need to go to a professional or to somebody else to help you to assist you whether it be in regression or healing or talk therapy or anything else he says to do that but the point is don't stuff it down and don't be the one that's aware and wants to keep it quiet and not heal it and he says and when i say keep it quiet it doesn't mean you have to go raising all these flags saying no more and we're we can't hide this or anything else but he says within yourself and what's oh. right for yourself right okay no i mean that uh, you can also like stop this inheritable spiritual dna by doing a quantum session and like going to the akashic records and kim boyd i know she has a technique where she can sort of get rid of oh maybe you have diabetes that runs and has run in the gener for generations there's a genetic component but it's really probably spiritually based that people who really cannot digest the joy of life is one of the main things okay let's talk about now the same thing uh, uh, applies um, to non-consensual, um, non-incestual abuse. Uh, we, we talked about uh, a, a predator and, and victim um, in incestual abuse, but these same things you were talking about probably also uh, work for, you know, is a good approach for those who are in that abusive you know non-incestual type sexual relationship yes any any type of sexual abuse okay so what any type of abuse yes okay so why do some people feel so sexually attracted to minors to children and is there a spiritual reason for that hmm and he says that this one um this one is difficult because again, it has 
it has a different answer for a different person because it's not all a one size fits all answer. Oh, yeah. However, he says there are a couple things there, and one has to do with emotional maturity. He says, um, so we'll look at an individual that may have had an experience in their life that triggered or scarred them at a certain age. So we'll say, say it was seven years old and there's um, like an emotional component that's not connected where they emotionally connect to a child where they feel uh, an inferiority to somebody their age. And Eric is saying that it's, um, he keeps using the word demented, but it's like a, it's like when you believe something, um, and he's saying that this is just one component of it. When you believe something and you connect with it and you believe that that's what the truth is, you believe that you truly do love children. Okay. You believe that that is something that you really do have within you. Now, he also said that we can also look at this being from past lives. There is some of that that works in here as well. He's also showing me um, a split that there are some individuals that have a split. Um, it's like part of them is uh, split with a child. Um, it's like they're not entirely there like a, an aspect of them is split and this has to do with trauma okay I can so see yeah um it's a way of he said that and not having self-blame it's like some other split off part is responsible for this it's not me maybe and 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 then again he says and then we also look there's also uh it's a there's a form of mental illness as well um he said that it is it's a really uh, fine line because children are children. Children are not emotionally uh, mature enough to understand sexual behavior. And so that's where we also look at the judgment yeah. because children are children yeah. and we protect them. And so he said, it's very hard to understand a mind that works that way. It's very difficult to understand yeah. if it, these minds are, aren't working. Uh, uh, typical. Okay, so uh, of course, some may think they really love a child or love children and become sexual predators because of that. But surely there are some that just want to control and they feel like, well, children are easy. Yes. So I'm superior. Yes. And what about Jeffrey Epstein? What was his reason? control yeah okay i believe it all right molestation i guess it's the same thing right it, it, molestation molestation not only of children of course but adults this person wants to know why yes and that so as we open up into the conversation of control because eric says that was the next component that he was going to speak of is that this um when we talk about this inferiority, um, picking, Eric's calling them like a lamb, having eyes on a lamb, whether this is an adult or whether this is a child, it's that um, feeling of being superior, of um, Eric showing like pumping up the chest, like I am big, I am strong, you're little, you're small, you do what I say. And there is um, a, it's like a, a turn on, um, mm. but he's saying that this is not a, it's, it's not that it's, because Eric won't say that it's a bad feeling. Um, and I kind of, I feel like arguing with him with this. He's like, it's not bad. He says, we can't say that it's bad, but it's this. Um, what's wrong is the overtaking of somebody else's free will. Yeah. 
and and that's that's really the basis of it but molestation has a lot to do with control and has to do with sexual pleasure and um there's also a sense of um like a sense of shame that follows that that when they pick a victim that feels emotionally or not um uh somebody that's dependent um okay so like uh what do you mean Eric? okay like somebody who's being given money mm -hmm. and they're being molested yeah they take that shame and that guilt and they turn it back on well you're dirty enough to take the money yeah so that they use that same they project oh. that same behavior so they don't see what they're actually doing they don't even though right. they know they know yeah all right so they must the, the people who are um, that do the molestation and the incest uh, any kind of sexual abuse uh they must not really love themselves if they're coming from the i i'm bigger i'm in control kind of thing there must be a lot of self-loathing from obviously their childhood their maybe another life etc Yes. So anytime that another, a human being is taking over or beefing themselves up in any way to take over another human being, they are disconnected from their higher selves. They have in that moment, um, they're not connected with our with our source with god however we yeah they're completely disconnected um <clears throat> um he's also saying that it's there if we look at this as there are um a lot of negative type energy that sits with a lot of that too um, because it's a lot of low vibration behaviors. And so what Eric is showing me is that some of these people that do these things, when they beef themselves up in that way, there's like a, a negative energy and entity type beings that will beef up with you. Okay, so the, you know, because maybe of their self-loathing, their energy is low enough that these negative entities attach to them and encourage this kind of behavior, right? Yes, and Eric says nine times out of ten, they're also um, using another form of addiction oh, okay. as well. So whether it's um, drug addiction, alcohol, uh, it's usually something because um, he says there's like a it's not just one thing that has their vibration like that. Oh, There's yeah. more than one thing, so it's a nice big opening. So how do you get rid of the negative attachment? Of course, you have to well, learn how to love yourself or things will come right back. You have back. to be aware. You huh? have to be aware. He says you have to be aware to begin with. Oh, so yeah. when you look at an individual, um, and he says an individual that has done these things is still an individual that can change themselves still an individual that has the opportunity to redeem their life every single human being has the free will to do that however um that individual also needs to recognize that there's something that is wrong that they're doing that does mm -hmm. need to change to be able to see that they are being assisted by a darker energy and he says that's not such an easy thing to do especially when you have money and you have power that's mm -hmm. wrapped around in it yeah i bet oh that's awful so so if you if these people can elevate their vibration real become aware etc will the negative entity just go away or do you have to like have special crystals or something like that it can um he's talking about it being disbanded of course depending on the situation depending on the layers because energy just doesn't come in one layer it is multiple layers over somebody's life and when they're not releasing it that energy might transform to some degree um but he says there'll be layers and some past life layers there as well so 
if a person were to make drastic changes in their life, their consciousness will continue to expand so that what is necessary for them to clear will become apparent to them okay. as they come forward. So he says, anybody, um, and he just says, anybody who's listening to this right now who thinks that they're too far gone and they can't change and all these horrible things, he goes, know that it just takes that one thought to keep moving yourself forward out of a vibration. Um, and that really you don't have to go after anything. It comes to you as you continue to just work on feeling better. Oh, that's good. All right. So, um, I, I'm, I'm just in the interest of time. I'm going to assume that rape is, 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 is there anything different, uh, in regards to sexual predator, sexual prey in the rape situation than what we've talked about with molestation and sexual abuse? Not, not really. There's just, um, Eric says we can add um, less focus on mental manipulation and more focus on physical rage. Oh, well, that more makes focus sense. on on phys physical um, overtaking. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, what is the the reason, spiritual reason, for the victim to play a part in any kind of sexual abuse? or molestation, which is sexual abuse. <clears throat> Do they come in with a contract and are they trying to learn something? Yes, um, he says that the, the biggest thing would be to love themselves through adversity, to love themselves through the projection of shame. Um, depending on what each victim's life path would be there would be maybe individual um a big one okay big one is self-love um often that somebody that it has been a victim of a crime or of a sex crime um it eats away untreated eats away at their self-esteem at their own value so there's a lot of uh, lessons with self-value, self-love, self-respect. Self-empowerment probably too, right? Self-empowerment, absolutely. Now we're back. Uh, I think I'm going to divide this into two parts because I got so many questions. And, hmm. you know, so we'll maybe do two, like, 45-minute videos. Um, and All right, what can we do about, along the same lines, what can we do about sex trafficking? That's a big problem. Yeah, that's a really, um, he says that's something that, again, has many different layers to it. And um, there's involvement from different areas in the world. Um, okay. Pick, like, what's one thing, Eric? Like, one. So he says that. It on he goes for the sake of time if I just say one thing is awareness the awareness um this is happening underneath our noses this is happening around us in our cities it's happening in our neighborhoods and he says the awareness and to not closing your eyes to what's going on um, that's that's the first part and he says each individual um, he's talking about individuals coming together as groups that there are many different groups that are um, focusing or focusing to save as many women and children as they can yeah. And there's also an, other groups that are focusing on the individuals that are obtaining children, women, children, and men. There are men in there as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Mm. Yeah. All right. But Eric um, said it, it, it's definitely, uh, definitely awareness. Okay. Uh, so... It's really weird, uh, and you know, the, the West, at least the United States, I can't, we were populated by Puritans. And uh, I think, I may be wrong, 
um, that for that reason, our American culture, I mean, we'll have movies that show dismemberment, but oh my God, no frontal nudity without being slapped X or R or whatever. That's not as much anymore, but so uh, compared to the, in Europe and whatever, they go topless, it's, you know, they're not, there's not as much shame about our naked bodies. Do you want to address that at all? Yeah, Eric says, so one thing that tends to divide, uh, and he says it's, it's, <laughs> he says, I'll be cautious in saying this, but religion plays a big part in that. Mm. So um, he's talking about funding in the media and everything as well. So um, when we have strong beliefs on who are, who is the viewer, who is the funder of what goes out socially um, in the media. He's also saying that this is also connected to ourselves, to our personal selves, and the idea of what is outside of us. Um, so something that would be um, seeing something dismembered or something done outside of us has a different vibration than showing the physical body okay because that connects to ourselves that connects to shame that um, connects to religion to what we were taught to believe and the other can be passed off as just what we were talking about we're talking about trafficking you can close your eyes and pretend it's not happening yeah. it doesn't affect me personally that's true so um, i bet there's some spiritual dna there too i mean from the puritans you know shame 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 your body is just horrible and should be hidden etc is there yes yes okay. he says there is um just as much as there is um different cultures how they feel different ways about things um he said there is our beliefs um built into your dna and he says think of um things such as a marriage is not a marriage until it's consummated Oh yeah, these, these belief systems and all of these things that um, carry forward. Yes, he says absolutely, without a doubt, that is a big part of it. I remember as a little girl, I I would always think, oh my God, if I get married, then the husband is going to see me naked. I just, oh my God, no. But how do you get over a uh, body? How do you remember thinking that too? <laughs> how, how do we get over body shame? Yeah. Go to a nude beach. He says, <laughs> Take it all off. <laughs> That's what he just said. He just, oh, really? He, I've been to it and my just husband, like I this. Off my, class, but my husband refused to take off his. Anyway, and now you know. <laughs> Eric just showed himself. He's like, let it all hang out. And he's doing yeah. this. He's like, just let it all hang out. Because that's a good way. But he says, you have to take this one step at a time. He goes, and remember, because you're not the body, but you also have a body that you're able to manifest and you're able to um, decorate and mm -hmm. do all kinds of things that are within your control. But he says, okay, he goes, Michelle, tell them how you got through your body shame or what, how that. And so uh, I'll just share, um, when I had cancer, mm -hmm. um, before I had cancer, I was so caught up in how I looked physically. And when I had lost everything, in my body, when I had lost my hair, my eyebrows, my eyelashes, mm -hmm. I had gained weight from the medication, the chemotherapy, I had a big round face. And to be honest with you, I looked like a bowling pin. Oh. That's what I looked like. That's what my body looked like. And shiny and bald like a bowling pin. Oh. It's just the way I was. Yeah. And um, to me, had you have asked me beforehand, before having that experience, if I was comfortable with my body, I was not in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I'd even lost 100 pounds prior, and I still wasn't happy. Yeah. So I did realize, truthfully, through that experience, and that was part of the lesson for me. I was wondering, yeah. Yes, that was a very big one, was to realize that I had everything stripped away from me. 
and I had no choice but to focus on myself. Yeah. That's all I had was who I was. And that's what I did. Wow. So Eric says, you don't need to go through that experience to, um, to be able to look inwards to your true self. But he says, imagine that. Take away all that mm. stuff. Yeah. And really look at who you are because he says the body is the body. And he said, you focus on things that other people probably don't even notice about you in the first place. That's right. But he says the easiest way to get over it and to get over how you feel about yourself is to start thinking about how you feel about yourself and start making choices to focus on what is good about yourself because if you do that as a practice every day that will start to drown out the other things and you'll start to realize that the other things are not so bad that's right and when you realize that okay i am not my body that's probably pretty important I'll this these are like the clothes i wear and walk around the house naked people yes. I, I do that, but she's scared <laughs> he's gonna walk in I know my kids would be like me a time, but maybe they'll bring, a, bring along a friend. You never know that. <laughs> I remember oh, I knew that I was getting old when I came out of the bathroom and the bug insect guy, exterminator, I didn't know he got in. Um, and, <laughs> and I was just half, I mean, just the top was, was off. And um, I just got out of the bath and he went, like, like he was horrified. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. But anyway, okay, one last question and we need to close. Okay. Is having an orgasm a motivator for committing heinous crimes? You know, like serial killers, the getting off to, you know, um, having sex um, with their victims. Hmm. Uh, he says it's not the motivator. So it's part of the, um, it's part of the charge. So it's, it's just part of it. Okay. So that's something that comes along with it. So he says, you think of anything that um, gets your adrenaline running. Yeah. Imagine that feeling of adrenaline and an orgasm goes with the adrenaline. So it is a release. There is all kinds of things happening at the same time, but he says that's not the only thing that's happening. Okay. It's a whole body experience. Yeah. Mind. And probably power. They feel like you're yes. going to be yes. superior on your ass. Okay, that's yeah. great. Thank you, Eric. I love you. Thank you, Michelle. I love you. Y'all view her site, which is thehealingart.com, but there is a, what do you call that? A little dash between the H and, you know, right after the H. And yes. I'll put it here. Boop. Yes. So we'll do part two. Oh, we're going to cover all sorts of like fetishes, like coprophilia, mm. necrophilia. Look, that Eric's like bestiality. Mm. I mean, we've got a lot to cover. I need All right. to work on this one. All right. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Eric says bye. Bye, bye sweetie. Bye.